and yeah. Go ahead and share my screen. All right, how are we looking? We're looking good, Stephanie. All right, well, <laughs> thank you and hello everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us here. Zanya said, I'm Stephanie and Atello and I are excited to speak with you all on creating space for pollinator beneficial insect habitat on your small and urban farms. So Zanya did a nice job of introducing myself, but I'll do a little bit of that too um, and introduce Cersei's and then I'll turn it over to like Hello to introduce himself and his farm. Um, so yeah, so I'm Stephanie Steele. I'm a new uh, Cersei's pollinator conservation specialist working with historically underserved small and urban ag producers, primarily in the Southeast Michigan, Detroit area. Um, I'm also an NRCS partner biologist. And so with that, I'm working on, uh, working with the NRCS on conservation planning for pollinator habitat in these spaces. And then before I move on, I just wanna highlight this photo that we see on our, on our cover here. It might look familiar to some of you. Um, this photo was taken by my Iowa coworker, Sarah Nizzi, um, at Cultivate Hope Urban Farm in Cedar Rapids. And here she's just highlighting some of her work on beetle banks, which we see here. All right, and then a little bit about the Xerce Society. Uh, so we are an invertebrate conservation nonprofit organization that protects wildlife through conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. So we're protecting a life that sustains us like insects, which are, you know, the little things that run the world. And we work with folks like you guys. Um, we're using applied science to guide our habitat restoration, conservation efforts, policy, and education, uh, educational materials. And then with that, you know, we're doing a lot of on the ground conservation work with programs um, in pollinators, different ag agricultural spaces, endangered species, pesticides, um, and also community engagement. Uh, and with that, just because we have new folks here, um, again, I wanna encourage people to say where they're joining us for today and then also maybe why, why you decided, what interested you about our topic, our talk today. You can put that in the chat. We'd love to, we'd love to learn a bit more about our audience. All right, and then moving on. Um, so Xerces's main office is located in Portland, Oregon over here. But as you can see from this map, we do have staff across the, across the country uh, working on those different topics, like we mentioned, habitat restoration, conservation planning, and technical assistance that ranges from agricultural, natural, and urban areas. And so now I'm gonna turn things over to like, hello. Uh, I wanna let him introduce himself a little bit more and kick us off into urban ag. All right, thank you, Stephanie. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Kello Paramoko. I'm the farm manager for Keep Growing Detroit. I've been so in that position for about two years now and been with the organization for a little bit longer than that. But Keep Growing Detroit started in 2013. We're a nonprofit that's located in the center of Detroit. Our mission is to help the city become a food sovereign place where a simple majority of the foods eaten there are also grown there by Detroiters. We're dedicated to food sovereignty and community engagement at every step. Next slide, please. On the picture here, we have some of a snapshot of the goals that we reached in 2021. And to reach our goal, we run numerous programs throughout the city of Detroit, most notably our garden resource program where we distribute transplant seeds and other resources to about 2000 gardens within the city of Detroit. And those gardens range from market gardens, backyard gardens, all shapes and sizes. And for about 15 or $30 per year, participants receive about 300 to $700 worth of resources to help make gardening accessible. 
We also run Grown in Detroit, which is a co-op made up of growers from the Garden Research Program that are ready to sell their produce at the market. Growers work together to set prices and keep the table full. Keep Grow Detroit handles the regulation side of it and the growers get to keep 100% of what they sell. Next slide, please. And so urban agriculture includes the cultivation, processing, and distribution of agricultural products in urban and suburban areas. Next slide, please. But for me, it's simple. People grow food where they are. Wherever people are, we have, we need the ability to grow food. Not long ago, the majority of the world used to be farmers and we lived in rural settings. Currently, we don't grow the majority of the foods that we consume. I'd say we are experiencing a disconnect from the land and the understanding that comes with growing our own food. Now, although there is that disconnect and limited access to land, people still have a need and interest to grow food where they are. So whether it's rural, urban, farming, it's still people addressing the same core needs. Keep Grow Detroit seeks to help make gardening accessible as much as possible. And being in an urban setting provides us with the unique position to reach new and beginner growers. Next slide, please. So as mentioned, we run numerous programs throughout the city to connect people with growing food and also connecting them with community members. We start as early as you know, kids can be to get into the garden with our early hood child education program. We also have a youth apprentice program that I started off in back in 2015. And then I came on as full staff in 2016. So that's, a, I guess, a hint at my age. <clears throat> But we're very focused on making sure that people have a pathway for careers within growing food, which um, each application for our garden research program, people get a soil test included, a 30 by 30 area, so that they know what's happening within their soils. We also provide access to fruit trees, garden consultations, and we also help people with navigating the land acquisition process, and we have a thorough educational series that runs throughout the year that has classes on farms and also online classes as well. And then of course we have to cook the food as well. So cooking classes to help make get things excited, working with chefs from across the city to help highlight different produce. And we are also starting a indigenous food waste program to help people learn about the foods that are natural and historic to the uh, area. And then we also do policy advocation, advocacy work. And we also run special projects throughout the city from greenhouse builds, um, water catchment builds, and so on. And then we also have cookouts just to get people connected with each other. Next slide, please. And so the photo above is our, well, me in our greenhouse, which it's filled up with transplants about three times a year. I believe this one right here is right in the middle of our hot crop distribution. And to the side is a picture of our distributions that we have three times throughout the year where people come and pick up transplants from us. This is more like a big family reunion that happens three times a year where people come in April, May, and July to pick up transplants for the according season. And at every point, we try to get people involved in mix and mingling with each other. So all those transplants were done by Keep Growing Detroit staff. All that work is done by the community, volunteers, and so on. Same with our distributions. We ask people to come out and help and participate as much as possible. Next slide, please. And within our goal of becoming a food sovereign city, we're at about 10% of that goal, but What's really important is just getting people connected as much as possible. So from either doing the seed packings together, doing art on the farm, weeding together, building greenhouses, you know, the real goal is to connect people as much as possible. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and 
One of my favorite things about working in agriculture is how we can connect to other industries and people. Farmers engage with students, teachers, chefs, artists, scientists, engineers, and other farmers, of course, lawyers, healthcare providers, politicians, and even conservationists like Stephanie. Keep Growing Detroit's conservation work is mostly focused on supporting and increasing the access that people have. Our journey with uh, native plant production began small in 2017. It was my first year in the uh, propagation lead role. And I was given an open flat of overwintered native plants and was given the task of salvaging uh, what was there. And to me, it looked like it was just some soil and some moss in a flat. So fast forward uh, some years and a continual trial and error. And now we're producing thousands of native plants for community and partner members. Next slide, please. And within that supporting role, we've uh, figured out ways to get more involved with conservation work from working with those different partners that are uh, interested and in, in need of native plants. And so we, at our farm, we have a two, um, well, one 30 by 140 foot greenhouse that you all saw in that picture that we uh, grow our transplants in, but we also save some place, save some space in there for native plant production. So many, um, of our partners that are in need of native plants for conservation work and plantings, they have to go you know, far out for native plants to other nurseries. And so we open up our space to kind of help limit that, um, let's say our, well, blanking on the word, our, our footprint, if you will. And so we've uh, opened up our greenhouse for those uh, people to purchase native plants from us and save a couple of uh, trips as well. And we've also opened up our space as a demonstration site. So we have native plants planted on the farm for community members, volunteers to come out and see native plants just in their natural flow. And we've also opened up our space to be a host site for uh, classes and also plant distributions. Many of our partners you know, give away plants to people across the city and so on and so. That's just some of the ways that we help build that community. And in that, we're also you know, sharing our community as well. So we have our vegetable growers meeting up with our native plant growers and it's more like a cross-pollination, if you will. Next slide, please. Now, there are some unique challenges to growing in an urban setting. There are many things that growers need to be aware of from their site history, knowing <clears throat> not only if there was any construction or any type of uh, building left over, but also the quality of the soil as well. And so, as I mentioned, one thing that we also include in the garden research program, a 30 by 30 soil test, so people can be aware of what they're gonna grow in and be able to make the according decisions after figuring out that information. But also the land ordinances, which are, super important for avoiding uh, unnecessary cost from things like blight tickets and also learning how to communicate with your neighbors about the food that you're growing and then also helping people navigate the uh, well the land access question of you know whose land is this that we want to grow on or how do we get to um, purchasing that land so we can grow on it and then also knowing how you're gonna keep those plants well watered throughout the season and then managing watering and utilizing resources like water catchment systems and irrigation systems and managing the storm water. Next slide, please. So here at our farm, this is a picture of the side of our infill greenhouse. And on the other side, we have our raised bed area with the border of native plants. So at our farm, we've uh, incorporated native plants in such a way that they support our needs of our pollinator habitats, our site beautification, and also a place for us to demonstrate what it's like for those plants to look like, and also stormwater management. We, we view native plants as a living permanent infrastructure that you might need to weed every now and then. And so in this picture right here, 
these native plants are serving the role of really helping us protect our soil um, structure and keeping our soil uh, very nice and firm despite all that water that just happened. This picture was taken a day right before we had, well, right after we had a heavy rainstorm. And so those native plants are always in work. And I'm gonna pass it over to Stephanie. All right, thank you. And uh, yeah, so now I'm gonna transition us into diving deeper to better understand why we're focusing on pollinator habitat and the importance of it. All right, so, you know, first, I think it's important to recognize, and I'm, sh I'm sure most of you know this, but uh, recent studies have shown that invertebrates, including pollinators and other insects, are declining at an alarming rate. And so there's many factors that are contributing to this decline, and it does include uh, habitat loss is, is a main factor, and this habitat loss can be contributed to uh, urbanization, intensified agriculture, or even like loss of farmland, uh, poor land management, uh, including invasive species and other habitat degradation, as well as resource competition, pesticides and disease um, are a few of these habitat loss causes. But with creating habitat, even on a small scale, this can be very impactful to larger conservation efforts and improve habitat fragmentation and you know, better help connect those together. Another important reason that I'm sure we most of us know is that you know pollinators are a vital ecological keystone species. And so here I want to recognize, at least in, in the US, we have about 3,600 different species of native bees. And so a diversity of pollinators are required for many of the world's crops and wild plants, um, this being you know, more than 85% of our flowering plants and 35% of our crop production is relying on primarily insect pollination. And you might guess just by looking at how diverse these different bees even look, but yeah, these pollinators have a diverse diversity of different life history strategies and that is very different than um, what most folks think of with bees with uh, our European honeybees. I also want to recognize some of the other main groups of pollinating insects uh, that we see here, like butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, and beetles, all also important pollinating insects. Um, and then another reason, you know, pollinator habitat supports the needs of other wildlife. So through this pollination, through this process, you know, the goal is fruits, fruits and seeds are being produced. Some we're gonna consume and others that are essential for, you know, many different mammals, birds, other organisms, but the insects themselves are also important food sources for these same organisms. And we get other eco ecological services such as nutrient cycling and decomposition. And then adding habitat for pollinators can also provide habitat for natural enemies. So these are gonna be insects that hunt and eat or parasitize some of uh, these crop pests. And this strategy is called conservation biological control. So many natural enemies, uh, they will also consume pollen and nectar. So adding these flowers for bees and pollinators is also providing habitat for these healthy populations of natural enemies who are gonna help us help control pests in our crops. And then here's some more examples of those insect allies in action. Um, up on the top, we see lady beetles, uh, we see a larva and the adult feeding on aphids. Here's a, a predatory wasp. And then these are aphid mummies of a parasitoid wasp. Uh, we have surfid flies, 
lace wings, and minute pirate bugs. So these are all examples of some of these beneficial insect allies. And then, of course, this isn't an, an exhaustive list, but the last point that I really wanted to highlight is that increasing the presence and diversity of native or even naturalized trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants can help reduce some of these climate change impacts. And so I wanna look at heat islands for an example, look at those effects, and uh, that they can be reduced by planting trees and low growing vegetation, and that the shade from the tall vegetation like these trees, and that the evapotranspiration that occurs from low growing vegetation can significantly help lower temperatures, sometimes being you know, upwards of 20 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you know, looking at this photo too, we see the beauty in these flowers and having access to nature and um, you know, having these, these plantings in urban areas is really important for the community to have, have these experiences. So, you know, we've gone over some of the reasons for habitat, but now I kind of want to switch gears and get more into depth on the aspects uh, that's involved in planning, planning these habitats. So one of the first steps in habitat planning is to assess and, you know, we want to assess the value of the, pollen, of the habitat on our site. And Circe's, for example, we have several different assessment guides, um, and this is just a, a small selection of them that we see here. Um, these guides can be used to help, help you evaluate your site for its existing pollinator potential. And you, you know, you want to use these early in the design process. You can also come back uh, later and, you know, help uh, improve as well. And uh, these are easy to use and they're good at helping you kind of zero in on the strategies needed for your specific site. And we have uh, the habitat assessment for yards, gardens, and parks that works well for urban ag sites. Uh, but another good one is this assessment uh, for larger farms and ag sites, and then this beneficial insect habitat one. And so, you know, it's good to first identify and understand what habitat currently exists to better know what changes your site could benefit from, or maybe to reaffirm some of the practices that you already have in place and that, you know, are good habitat. And then now I'd like us to kind of like explore some of the dynamics within an urban landscape and look for opportunities here, as there are actually many unique opportunities to create habitat for pollinators and even other wildlife and help increase connectivity and habitat corridors through, you know, an environment that we've we've changed that design drastically. And so we can kind of follow these, these patterns along to see the different connectivity that's occurring um, in this example of an urban landscape. Uh, we can look at sidewalk strips and yards. Uh, these are great and common locations for planting. And yeah, they act as great connectors. But do keep in mind, you know, when, when planning, closer to the sidewalk, that these might be subject to more drought and pollutants. Uh, so when we're planning, you know, keep this in mind because, you know, hardy species will probably do better here, uh, maybe even shorter statured plants. Uh, so then they're, you know, less likely to flop over into the street or the sidewalk. Um, also, we see a lot of impervious surfaces, right? Urban areas have a much greater percentage of impervious surfaces. But you know, there's still habitat opportunities here. Um, you can remove these impervious surfaces. You know, it's gonna be more costly and you contractors involved in things. Um, but you can also build on top of them. You could bring in uh, containers and raise 
beds and plant into those. But you know, there's also things to consider when doing that, because when, especially with native plants, you wanna think about extensive root systems, containers can also be more susceptible to the environment. So think about how temperature change affects them. Hot and cold seasons, you know, more watering in the summer, in the heat, and more susceptible to cold and freezing in the winter. So keep that in mind, as well as um, with deep hazing, how you're gonna rebuild the soil health. Uh, and then I also just wanna reiterate, again, kind of touching on what Akella mentioned earlier, but do look into your local city ordinances and regulations as these can also impact habitat plantings or agricultural practices. Because, you know, we want to be aware and avoid these types of citations. And then I like this image as well as an example. Um, you know, it shows a similar intensity and diversity that we often see on some of our urban and small farms. Um, it also helps us to identify a variety of different habitats that we might see in these spaces, which expand beyond just planting flowers. And so look at this um, standing dead tree over here. It's also called a snag. This can be a really great, uh, offer great habitat for variety of cavity nesting bees, wasps, or even other wildlife. Uh, we have hedgerows present. Uh, there's also wildflower patches for strips within the crop planting, within the crop fields. And then not pictured here, but I think, <laughs> I think this might apply to a lot of folks that maybe you have like a rock pile or a brush pile or something on site that, you know, it's off in the corner and you've been meaning to clean it up, but you've got other things that you're doing. But that brush pile and rock pile could also be uh, an excellent site for habitat for lots of different wildlife. Okay, and then now we've talked some about like what is needed for habitat, but there are these three main elements of quality habitat that I really wanna highlight um, during this planning uh, process. And so first, providing food. So food as in pollen, nectar, even host plant material. Um, and these plants can also, you know, attract prey species too. Um, second is shelter. So protected nesting and overwintering sites, both above and below ground. Uh, third, protection and risk mitigation from pesticides. Um, so we wanna support pollinators throughout their life cycle. Uh, this is really critical in the planning and creating habitat for them. Um, and I should also mention, when we're looking at native bees, for example, uh, the majority of their life that we see, you know, we see them flying as adults up above ground, but the majority of their life, instead of these adults we see, they're in a developmental phase in or diapause in their nest cell, whether it's in the ground, in wood, in a cavity, et cetera. So we need to keep that in mind and make sure we're protecting those sites. And so to provide the best habitat, we need to understand these life, life history of these insects. So I've already alluded um, to these different bee groups, but with, with these native bees, um, the majority of them are solitary and will have one of these three nesting strategies that we see here. So about 70% of our native bees uh, use the ground to nest in. Another approximate 30% nest in stems or dead wood. And then another, you know, about 1% are social nesters, uh, like the bumblebees here that we see, who often will nest in um, unoccupied rodent burrows. And then to protect ground nesting bees, so I want to dive a little deeper into this. 
So the majority of our bees are ground nesting, solitary. And with that, there's some important things to remember. So we want to try and do our best to avoid heavy tillage, tillage in general if we can, um, especially in known like nesting sites or other heavy ground disturbance uh, when possible. We also want to have and uh, make available areas that are free of plastic or avoid plastic, uh, such as landscape fabric or even using heavy mulch could be a barrier too. So sites with pebbles or white rocks, a mulch like this could actually be good uh, and attractive nesting sites too, or nesting materials. So keep all these things in mind, and I know it can't necessarily apply to the whole area, but even having some inclusive spaces that are free of um, some of these uh, some of these materials are beneficial. And then this bottom photo here shows the nesting aggregation. And just remember that these bees are mostly solitary. And so these solitary bees are not aggressive and they're not and they don't defend their nests. So this wouldn't this wouldn't be alarming. And then the other large majority of our solitary bees nest in dead wood or hollow or pithy stems from plants. And so to create habitat for these species, we want to plant species that have hollow or pithy stems, like echinacea, like we see in, in this um, example here with this infographic that goes through the different seasons, goes through the life cycle of the bees that would be nesting in them, and helps explain what's happening and um, how and how much and when we can prune. And so echinacea, goldenrod, joe pie weed, mountain mint, spirea, aruba species, um, many more of these are really good examples of plants that have hollow or pithy stems. Uh, also leaving dead wood, like we see here. This also makes great habitat for these nesters. Uh, when we have dead wood like this, they're occupying, um, they're occupying cavities that fetal larva had previously excavated. Um, so reusing those homes there. We can also use these dead woods like logs or even larger branches, um, you know, to act as defined borders to your habitat planting area. All right, and now we're gonna talk a little bit more on plant selection and some of the requirements and considerations and examples of plant species there. So I've already touched some on considerations uh, for plant selection, but there's other factors that we also wanna focus on. Um, so most importantly, uh, we wanna choose native herbaceous and woody species that are adapted to our region, adapted to your site conditions, and will provide a succession and a diversity of blooms throughout the seasons. And so um, sometimes it might be tricky to find, you know, some plants that are good early bloomers. So keep in mind that native trees and shrubs are really good options there for providing these early springtime blooms. Um, many of these can also be good resources uh, for nesting too, or might be fruiting and you can enjoy them and the wildlife can enjoy them as well. Uh, when we're looking at flowers, uh, we wanna make sure that we're including a diversity of plant families, flower shape and colors, you know, be more inclusive with this biodiversity of the plant selections, we're gonna attract a greater biodiversity of wildlife, making for more healthy habitat. Uh, other considerations include, you know, keeping in mind butterfly host plants. Um, so monarchs are a good example of that, uh, utilizing caterpillars, use, utilizing our native milkweeds, uh, but also being aware that, you know, the adults later in the season will need uh, flowering nectar resources too. 
um, availability and cost can also be a big factor in selection. And, you know, we recognize that. Uh, you can also make, it's good to get to know like your local native nurseries, have conversations with them about, you know, better understand their practices, what they're growing. Maybe you could request something that, uh, and see if that would be possible for them to grow too. And then in addition to these flowering resources, um, native grasses and sedges are an important component to wildlife as these can also be host plants for butterflies or shelter for a variety of insects, uh, including ground beetles or overwintering and nest sites for bumblebees. These plants also provide a really nice, you know, structural diversity to your habitat as well. Um, help with reducing soil erosion, help with water retention. And then one practice that you all might be familiar with, especially uh, our Iowa audience, and if you've worked with Sarah Nizzi, um, is, our, is the beetle bank practice. And so this is, uh, this is a type of long-term or permanent habitat and uh, habitat that, you know, we're referring to here for pollinators falls under the same category as well for long-term permanent habitat. Uh, that's what's most desirable. Uh, but for these beetle banks, what we're seeing is these are com primarily composed of native bunch grasses. Um, and then you can add a small component of uh, wildflowers as well to bring in a greater diversity of beneficial insects. So what beetle banks are functioning to do, uh, they wanna, they're providing habitat that's attractive to native ground beetles. Um, so they like uh, this drier, this drier soil. And so planting them on a berm can help keep that soil drier uh, and more appealing to these ground beetles. Also other beneficial insects uh, will utilize this space too. Um, but we like we like the ground beetles because they're really great predators for some of our crop pests like aphids, slugs, snails, and caterpillars. Um, and then here's an example of a screenshot of the cover of a new publication we have on the beetle bank practice if you want to learn more about implementation and species selection. All right, and then now I'm going to uh, let Akello go ahead and discuss some of his experience as a grower and producer. All right, thank you, Stephanie. All right, so we want to start native plants. And so before we begin growing with native plants, we need to understand that they require a couple more steps for germinating compared to uh, vegetable seeds. If you were to take a butterfly milkweed seeds and start them as you would some collar seeds, I'd be surprised if you get more than 20% germination rate. That's because many native plants have developed germination inhibitors to prevent them from starting in the wrong season. And so we have to mimic nature in order to break that dormancy and make that plant work for us. And so, when you purchase seeds, you should receive instructions on exactly how to do that. The most common instruction is an artificial stratification. And so this process involves mixing your seeds with some media, whether that's sand, perlite, vermiculite, just as long as it's a sterile um, base, and then mixing that with a little bit of water not too much that your soil is damp, but just enough that it's moist. It's very much similar to uh, making your media mix for your transplants and so on. And so you wanna place that bag inside of your freezer or cooler for the recommended amount of time. So typically you might see instructions saying to post stratify for 30 days, 60 days, or 120 days. It can really vary depending on plant for plant, but that's how long you wanna keep those inside of the cooler. I've had experiences where I've 
taken something out a little bit too early or haven't done it long enough and I got the you know resulting germination rates. And so during that time you're checking on your seeds because some seeds uh, like Coreopsis can germinate early inside of the cooler and so you want to be checking on your seeds daily or so. And you're also checking to make sure that they're not too wet and also not too dry. Things can get dry inside of the freezer. And uh, also when you put them inside of the bag, like you see here in the picture, you wanna make sure that that bag isn't totally sealed. You wanna make sure that just a little bit of it is open so that there's some airflow. And as that plant is going through its cold stratification process, you wanna try and mimic nature as much as you feel comfortable with. So in some cases, I'm taking my plants out of the cooler and then putting them inside of the freezer for a couple of days and then moving them inside of the cooler, just kind of mimicking how temperature naturally fluctuates throughout the season outside. And so after that period, <clears throat> you can sell your plants like you typically do with uh, transplant germination. Um, I prefer to use a 288 cell tray. These are very tiny little cell trays and spreading the seeds across evenly. The data plant seeds are typically very small. They do come in all shapes and sizes, but with these ones, they get super, super tiny, especially things like our great boo robilia. And so spreading them evenly across the tray and then making sure that you're not watering them too much and also not letting those seeds dry out. The biggest tips I have with uh, working with native plants is just making sure that you label, label, label as much as possible. Um, these are gonna be new plants with different types of cotyledon leaves and they're gonna be super tiny for a long time. And so until you get familiar with those plants, make sure that you're uh, keeping them labeled. In my system, I have my trays labeled also with like a popsicle stick sticking up inside of that tray as well. And then what I also like to do is start with multiple um, seed bags for um, stratification so that I can have uh, a margin of error, if you will. So if uh, one seed fails or if one bag fails, I still have at least, you know, another one to get me through this season and then Another tip is minimizing how you water your plants, whether in trays, these uh, plants can easily get um, too wet and they can also get too dry too. But the, the watering part is really gonna have to be a uh, trial and error, if you will. And to help you out with that, I recommend that you also begin with a media base that drains very well and is light. So something that includes sand, vermiculite, perlite peat moss, and I also like to have bark mixed in with the mix as well. So this is a pretty much a snapshot on getting your plants through the stratification process, the dormancy breaking process. There are many different other types of dormancy breaking processes that they might have you do from scarring a plant to pretty much just breaking the seed coat for it. Some plants, some seeds need to be boiled underwater for a certain amount of time. Other plants can just be sown like regular crops or some plants might need even shorter dormancy days, maybe like 10 days or so. So what you wanna make sure that you do is follow the instructions on that and another thing that's nice is that uh, beta plant seeds are very cheap to purchase. And so you can have you know, quite a bit of seeds for you know, $5, $10 to um, play with and get to know. Next slide, please. And so some of the plants that we love to grow at our farm include ZZ Aurea, one of my personal favorites, the butterfly milkweed, which doesn't have the milky sap like the rose milkweed that we typically see. The eagle and aster, this is a nice, big, beautiful purple flower that blooms throughout the fall. It's very nice and bushy. The bees love it. And also our prairie drop seed, which is a nice solid grass that uh, many uh, conservationists and also 
data collection enthusiast asks for it to have. So if you ever look into growing a grass, the prairie drop seeds definitely be on your list. But this is a mix of different types of native plant uh, species types. Next slide, please. And to help people you know, easily get into the, um, I guess the flow of planting and having native plants, KDD has done different types of designs in the past with um, landscape architects and also community members as well to um, do native plant designs. And so this is just highlighting one of them that we've done and see if I can see from here, but it includes some of the uh, native plants that we've grown here on the farm before, but it also includes some other, other, I guess not regular, but typical plants that you might see just within like front yard plantings as well. They might not be uh, specific native plants, but they are still beneficial to you know the environment as well and also other pollinators too. Next slide, please. And me and Stephanie wanted to do kind of a case study on the beginnings of the native plants in our specific uh, areas that we worked with. So this is an overview of our farm at the Heatgorn Detroit site. This is uh, located right across from the Eastern Market. And so this year is 2018 that this was taken. We just came on the site, you can still see some of the uh, exoskeleton of the greenhouse and our newly finished beds, which look very clean and also some other materials on the um, side there. But before I get into the native plants, a little site history about this space. So before 2018, back in around 2016 or 15, this land was operated by Greening of Detroit. And they uh, they had to do some land remediation with it in order to get it ready for um, prep. And so they did those soil tests and so on to understand what was there before. And what was there before was basically a construction site that had you no know, contaminated soils there. And so they had to do a process of remediating the soil, um, literally removing clumps of soil and then bringing in new soil. And so what we have here now is at least a 12 inch layer of sand separating the growing soil from you know, whatever's underneath. And then there's a, at least another layer of growing soil about a foot so that we grow in here at the farm. And so one of the important things that we have to keep in mind while we're operating the site is that we're making sure that we're not digging below or hitting that sand layer because that's where we're like, okay, can't dig any further, like time to stop, kind of move on to the next task. And so that's kind of the uh, background history of the land. It's okay, Keep Going Detroit came into operation of this site in um, 2018. And what we had to do is pretty much just uh, reset the field, if you will. So we had to remove the sod, remove a lot of weeds, just to um, get those out the way so that we can do some bed prep there and start some planting and particularly with our native plant space. So that exists it or it exists now where the saline triangle is next to the greenhouse. And so that lower half that's closer to the fits, that's an area that we knew was gonna be our native plants. And so, one thing about the field again, it's a six to inch slope going towards the fence. And so we know that water likes to pool there. And so we knew that it'd be a perfect spot for water loving native plants. And so of that, we've um, selected our plants that we wanted. We currently have there uh, really water loving plants, um, New England Aster, Rose Swamp Mellow, Columbine, Wild Columbine, and great bilobilia. And then we also have other plants that we just produce within our nursery. Planted there, black eyed Susans, and then Coreopsis, which are typically a dry and loving plant, but they do well anywhere. And so those are plants that really thrive within that space, and that helps us mitigate and 
control our water needs. Now through our getting those plants established, we basically just had to make sure that those stay weeded. So that sod, that crabgrass that's within there loves to come back and rhizominous. So we have to stay on top of that consistently. And then of course, water management, which isn't too much of a hassle there. And then just making sure that we replace plants just to um, keep that vitality up and from whatever plants that, you know, got lost along the way. All right, next slide. All right, gonna All pass right. it to Steph. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this one is mine. Uh, so I, I mentioned I haven't been in my position long, but I still wanted to highlight one of the habitat projects that I worked on last year. Uh, this is at an urban farm in Detroit. Uh, the site is located on a former elementary school and in total it covers about a little less than three and a half acres. Uh, I don't have all the details in uh, what they did, uh, you know, and starting their their journey, starting their uh, agricultural journey. But for at least this project, so they had a small area of uh, habitat already planted uh, with native forbs and bunch grasses, and they wanted to expand on it. And um, I know the vegetation cover prior to planting was primarily sod forming grasses and other you know, common like yard weeds that we have. Um, and site prep was, it was pretty, it was pretty simple um, for the planting that we did. So we, we used shovels and we had um, a manual sod kicker that we used to remove this vegetation. Um, the soils that we were working with, you know, in this area and in, in uh, the Detroit area, we have a lot of like, more heavy soils, clay is common here. Uh, we also have like kind of a loamy clay, loamy mix as well. Um, so, you know, we were opting for plants that would do well with those soil types and moisture requirements. Um, and then prior to planting, getting that ready, you know, we wanted to make sure that the ground was easier to work. So we watered it thoroughly before planting. And then again, after the plugs were in the ground, uh, we use just like hand shovels um, or, or other shovels to dig the holes to put the, the plugs uh, into. Um, and then after planting, uh, we covered the area uh, in about two to three inches of mulch. You know, we worked with arborists to get, you know, big chip drop <laughs> to use for this site. And this mulch is beneficial, uh, especially in the first couple of years of establishment to help reduce pressure from weeds and to help those soils retain moisture. But you know, you're still going to have to water, especially in the first year, um, water regularly, check, check the soil uh, moistures uh, to know when water is required. And then for the plant selection, I'll show you on the next slide uh, a few of the species that we used. But you know, we wanted to incorporate uh, a diversity of plants. So we opted for a number of plant families uh, and different flower colors, flower shapes, because you know we're really wanting to try and attract as many pollinators and other beneficial uh, insects as we could. I did learn a few things from working on this project um, and just continuing my work with Xerces learning uh, like other methods and techniques. And so one thing that I would like to try in the future, especially on some of these small and urban sites is using a black silage tarp to smother existing vegetation as a way of site prep. Um, I'd also like to try using a hand drill powered auger to help with digging these holes and to see how well that works in some of our, you know, like heavier clay soils and also urban urban soils. Um, these folks had in, included some native bunch grasses, but I definitely wanna work on increasing using native bunch grasses in these urban plantings and uh, 
getting folks more like accustomed to implementing those within the habitats as well. And then another thing I wanted to try was adding in more creeping plants, uh, low growing plants on the ground that could act as a living mulch. So, um, you know, like our native wild strawberry, that could be a good example of that and incorporating that into more of these plantings. And then another thing was, uh, you know, just trying out different seasons and seeing working with the busy schedule that folks in urban ag have, you know, which season could be the most compatible, but also looking at um, different like watering schedules and things. Um, so looking at a fall versus a, a spring planting, we did this in the spring. Well, actually this was in the like late spring, early summer. Um, you can plant all throughout the growing season, but you know, if you're planting in the summer, going to have to water, it can be a little harder on establishment and having to water those plants more. And so I wanted to share this study with you all. Um, when, so when choosing flowers to attract beneficial insects, MSU uh, has this study that they've done. And I think it's a nice place to start. Um, Iowa State University Extension also say, cites the same project on their page as a resource for you all to use as well. So many of these plants are still applicable, if not all of them are applicable to folks in Iowa and kind of our like Midwest region. And so these plants here uh, were found to be the best at attracting natural enemies and bees. Um, those with three stars, the best. Uh, one star is still good, but three stars is the best. And then the ones that I've highlighted in red here um, are some of the plants that we've incorporated in that example that I just went over with you all. And then for my habitat example, I mentioned some um, about the site prep method that we use by removing the sod. Um, and so here's a guide that we have that goes over other common organic site prep methods. You can use this table within the guide to help you determine what is the best way to prep your site based off factors like size of your habitat, your weed pressure, the slope of the, of the land, what resources you have available, as well as like timeline that you're working with. Um, so I definitely encourage you guys to check this out. So I mentioned sod removal. You know, sheet mulching is another kind of small scale common practice. Solarization, uh, this is where that uh, black silage tarp, sm smother tarp method falls into play too, um, even smother cropping. And then um, I also just want to briefly discuss starting habitat from seeds versus plugs or potted plants. So we're looking at so transplants. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list, but there, you know, there are some benefits and downsides uh, to both, depending on your abilities and capacity. And so for small urban habitat projects, I tend to favor using uh, the transplants these plugs or potted plants, you know, they're going to require less weed control, uh, quicker to establish. You're going to have more control over the, the design to make that, maybe make it more attractive and intentional looking. Uh, when planting in plugs, we also recommend planting in, in clumps of the same species of at least three or more. Um, this helps with, uh, you know, like attraction for like visual cues for the pollinators visiting them, ease and pollination too, because you know they're going to go to, uh, they'll continue visiting the same species of flower. And so if they're, they're together, that can be helpful for that as well, making it more efficient. Um, also, we should mention that, you know, these transplants, they can get, they can get expensive. So looking at a tenth of an acre, if we're planting at about 12 and a half inches apart, you're looking at about 4,000 plants. So, you know, you can change 
spacing. Uh, some plants have larger spacing and recommended spacing as well. Um, yeah, so cost and labor are common barriers for this method. And, you know, it just might not be as practical for uh, or cost effective for larger sites. And then I know we're coming up on the end, but I just briefly want to uh, just introduce some of the NRCS pollinator practices. Um, and so if you're not familiar with this program, uh, they're within the U.S. Department of Agriculture, or USDA, and NRCS stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service. So they provide technical assistance to farmers to address resource concerns on working lands. And then just going to just going to briefly mention some of their programs. And so the first one I wanted to highlight was the USDA People's Garden Initiative Project. Um, you know they work. They work uh, with community-oriented urban farms and gardens who are working to incorporate more sustainable practices. And <clears throat> they're really highlighting that community aspect. And so if we look at the map, I was here, and you guys do have several of these urban farms and community gardens that are uh, registered people's gardens. It does include sites. Um, I did, I did look it up. It includes a few places like People's Community Health Clinic in Waterloo or the Weatherby Edible Food Forest, Global Greens and Farms. And so if you're interested, you can go to the link and learn more. And then um, a new grant that just came out this week, a new competitive grant with the USDA uh, for urban ag and innovative production. Um, if you're interested in other uh, financial opportunities that focuses on planning projects and implementation projects. I encourage you to go to grants.gov and you can learn more about those opportunities there. And then these are some of the common NRCS um, EQIP habitat practices. EQIP is Environmental Quality Incentives Program. And so depending on where you are, some of these practices are available. Some of them are available to fit in urban and small scale. Some are still working their way uh, to be more inclusive to those types of production. Um, in Iowa, you guys might be most familiar with this conservation cover practice or maybe the cover crop practice. Um, so the conservation cover is using uh, seeds of native herbaceous plants to address uh, resource concerns such as wildlife habitat, improving that habitat for terrestrial and invertebrates. Uh, we also have practices for trees and shrubs um, or other hedgerow, which can include woody species as well as herbaceous. And then the stormwater runoff uh, has a practice scenario for rain gardens. And then there's also these associated practices that could be used along with these habitats or maybe otherwise on your farm. And then for folks that aren't familiar with the black silage tarp uh, site prep method, here's a nice example of that here. Um, this is used as a site prep method for, or a method to control like herbaceous weeds. Um, and yeah, this is a nice example of that. Uh, these practices are primarily addressing those resource concerns such as pest pressure uh, from invasive weed species or crop pests, uh, but can also help with soil erosion as well. And then you have more questions about any of this, any NRCS or USDA um, uh, technical assistance, I encourage you to, you can go to the website here that's listed, find your, local con uh, find your local conservationists, get in touch with them, build a relationship. If you're in Iowa, you can also reach out to Sarah Nizzi, especially if you're interested in pollinator beneficial insect habitat. And then the last thing that we wanted to share with you is just some resources. And so Xerxes has a lot of different educational resources. Here we see some of those on monarch and pollinator habitat, different guides, 
for creating that and how to be more inclusive on you know your farm or other lands and we also have lots of resources specific on beneficial insects so soil life or farming with other beneficial insects cover cropping planning here's that beetle bank publication too and we also have guidance on pesticides um, so pesticide mitigation reducing reducing your risk um, or if you're using them, how to more safely use them. Uh, so you can check those out as well. And yeah, we just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you again to PGI, Vanya, and Emma for having us. Like, hello, appreciate you. And keep growing Detroit for, for presenting with me. And also want to thank all of you for joining us here today and the supporters who help fund the work that we do. And here's our contact information and yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you all for sharing your time with us. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Stephanie and Akello. Really, that was really, really good. Learned a lot. Um, so if you have any questions for either Stephanie or Akello, feel free to put them into the chat and we'll go ahead and get some of those answers. Um, I did see one come in. I, I think it was pretty well answered. Um, I'm just kind of, if you're, if you have bare ground, you know, you're starting over with just a blank slate yard, what could you do to get started? You know, the easiest way to get started. If we're coming in with a bare yard, so just no vegetation. Yeah, I'm assuming it's probably just like a grass, you know, basic yeah. grass yard. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, one of the first things aside from uh, that Akello kind of mentioned um, is, you know, doing soil tests. So soil tests are always good. You can kind of, for one, testing for any toxins um, whether those are heavy metals or other, um, that is always a really great place to start, especially if we're talking about urban areas. Um, aside from that, um, our site prep guide is really helpful. So depending on what size of land, if it's just grass, it's kind of an easier, <laughs> easier um, vegetation to, to address. So the sod removal that I mentioned, like you can remove the sod and plant in the same day, potentially. Um, the smother tarping that I mentioned with that black silage tarp, that also works really well for, um, uh, for, for killing the grass too. Uh, you could lay that down, you know, you could lay that, that down in the fall, come back in the spring and, uh, you know, rake off the residue and you're pretty good to go. Um, you might need to build up some nutrients. So uh, doing like a, a, a season of cover crop or something could help build up those soil nutrients too. Um, Mikhail, if you want to add anything, you're welcome. I'd say if there's a... Uh... Got confused with my laptop. <laughs> I'd say one thing I would add, um, if there is a possibility to um, redirect drainage spouts toward that, towards that area, just making use of uh, all the resources that you have out of your land. All right. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to type them now. We've still got a few minutes, so. A question for Stephanie. What's your mm -hmm. favorite native plant? Oh, that is a good one. Oh, it's so hard. <laughs> it depends on the season. I feel like because we're in winter right now, and what one of one of the plants that I'm most looking forward to is one of the ones that you highlighted, Akello, the golden Alexander, the Zizia. I love it. 
Um, it's also, it, it's one of our plants that does really well in the urban areas too. Some might say in some situations, maybe too well, but it's easy enough to, you know, maybe uh, cut the heads off before it goes to seed if it's getting a little too rambunctious in your, uh, in your planting area. But it's one of my favorites because, you know, it's really showing that we're in this, we're in this, uh, new season where life is all coming together it attracts so many different insects too um see so many bees and uh other like wasps and flies all over it i say that like in the it. that in the mountain mint yeah <laughs> yes. oh yeah the mountain mint i do like that the uh this is you are in the unbell family so that a potential yeah. to attract the uh, black swallowtail. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Absolutely. Yeah. And the tiny little bees that are common in our area, whether it's some of the sweat bees, the little tiny little sweat bees, um, or even the, um, the mast bees, the cellophane mast bees that nest in, they'll nest in dead wood. They love that also. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Let's see if we give it a second here. Well, I have a question for you, <laughs> uh, for either one of you. Um, with the pollinators that you're trying to attract, you mentioned planting, you know, many types of different species of flowers, uh, really emphasizing color to attract as many types of bees in as possible. Um, with a lot of those bees coming in, it does attract a lot of wasps, which I realize are also pollinators. Um, is there a good kind of, I mean, I, I don't mean to say it like that, but is there a kind of wasp that we should be attempting to attract? Because all I seem to get are the, the red ones that are um, not, is not very friendly, um, but I do know that they are beneficial. So is there a certain type that you would recommend trying to attract? Yeah, so, you know, wasps are, honestly, they're one of the most diverse I think they are now the most diverse like organism that we have on the planet. It used to be beetles, but now wasps have succumbed that. So what you're referring to, Vanya, sounds like some of our social wasps that have, can, you know, they can display a little bit maybe more uh, aggressive or sometimes defensive behavior. Um, you know, like our yellow jackets or some of the paper wasps uh, who are might be interrupting your barbecue or, <laughs> mm -hmm. or something like that. But we have lots of other uh, solitary wasps. Um, I had a photo um, right when I was introducing the NRCS practices of, of this wasp on the New Jersey tea, the Ceanosis. Um, that's a solitary wasp we have. So same with bees, if, they're, if their lifestyle is the solitary, type, they don't have that same like large nest, you know, with their with their young and their food resources that they're needing to protect and defend. Um, they're, you know, they're just going about, they're going about what they need to do, which is either finding some nectar uh, for, the, for themselves. That's what the adults are, are using the pollen and the nectar to, to fuel their bodies or they're hunting some of these pests that uh, that we that that come in our in our in our garden. So one of my favorite um, solitary wasps are these uh, resin wasps. It's these this group of square-headed wasps, grabronids, um, and they you they nest in wood too, um, like some of our bees, and um, 
they'll collect resin from from tree sap or other plant resins um, but they hunt aphids and it's been counted that for each of their um, nest cells so they'll build a linear nest within the wood each of those cells which could be from like 10 or more and they'll make multiple of those those nests um, putting upwards of like 50 to 100 aphids in each cell it's amazing mm -hmm. <laughs> and these are these are small too so you might be seeing these solitary wasps that are smaller smaller and just not recognizing them for what they are and seeing more of these larger kind of wanting to make <laughs> wanting to make their selves known um, and maybe steal some of your food or drink. Um, so yes, there's lots of beneficial solitary wasps. Um, I was doing a bio blitz at a park in Detroit last summer. And at the end of it, we were all watching, um, watching one of these, uh, these large grass carrying wasps that I've seen nesting at your farm, Akello, and um, like your insect hotel all those large holes that are filled with grass. So they hunt, uh, they hunt mo mostly like orthopterans, so cricket, katydids and things like that, that might be eating some of the vegetation. Um, but we saw this one trying to carry the prey that it paralyzed uh, and like crawl away with it. And it was, everybody was so like curious and excited to see what was going on. It was fun. <laughs> That's All funny. Right. <laughs> oh, what's a bio blitz? Um, yeah, a bio blitz is a term that can be used um, for 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 the purposes I'm familiar with. You're going out and trying to survey all of the life in a particular area at a certain time, and so we're using. Um, for me, I was mostly looking at at plants and insects. And so recording our observations on the app called iNaturalist. Um, it's a really great resource if you're an aspiring naturalist or wanting to learn more about the natural world around you and try and put names to things. And it's also good uh, like community science initiative and this data can then be verified by scientists and be used for other like research uh, programs too. But yeah, essentially we're just trying to document and find, um, I was focused on pollinators and, and plants uh, in this park in the summer. And it's best if they're happening like over time. So then you can see potentially how those communities are changing um, over the years. All right, any other questions? Little more of a quiet audience today. I did have one for Akello. See, oh, I'm waiting to see if anyone wants to type one into the chat. Um, with Keep Growing Detroit, I was just curious uh, of kind of how many community members you have working on that and kind of what, how broad of a range within Detroit is using that as, a, as like a sustenance source. Yeah. So, how we measure that? So, we have our garden resource program and we get a number of gardens that participate each year. And so we're usually, well, currently we're hovering around 2000 gardens participating in the past two years of the program. And of that, we've estimated that those gardens within the work that they do or within the reach that they have, those gardens are reaching about 23,000 individuals um, total. Now in terms of the people that get involved, like the transplant production, helping out on the farm and so on. That number is a little bit different. And I can actually uh, pull that up from our dashboard. But that number is somewhere around uh, at least under a thousand or so. But let me get that for you.
All right. So we've had about a total of 1,200 people participate on the farm in 2021. And so quite a bit. And then I guess the average hours of those volunteers, 241 average hours. And then a total of, and that happened within 104 events. So those were either open hours where people can come during the afternoon and volunteer on the farm or plant volunteer events or seed packings or somewhere else, but yeah. Wow, that's very, very busy. Sounds really great. Oh, Sounds absolutely. like a great organization. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds you. very busy too. All right, I, I do not see any more questions. Um, so those that are remaining, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, when you sign out, you'll be directed to an evaluation, which we would greatly appreciate if you take the time to fill out. And thank you, Stephanie and Akello. All right, thank you, everybody. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, thank you.